Welcome one and all to Puppet History Online University! Today we'll be taking an ever whining look at yet another chapter in the heavy, heavy book we call history, while our guests ruthlessly compete for the coveted title of History Master. I am obviously your beloved host, the Professor! Ryan Bergara, are you ready? Why is there no hat on that fuzzy blue nutsack of a head of yours? I'm letting my, my dome breathe, bro. I think it looks beautiful. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Speaking of which, Kristen Chirico, our special guest, are you ready? I'm so ready! Then let's crack in! All right, so what? Before we get into this, you got some you got some qualms with my fashion choices here? Yeah, you look like you're in a Run DMC video. <laughs> you know, I'm lean, I'm limber, I'm, I'm, I'm limbered up, I'm ready to go. Are you supposed to be dressed like an Olympic athlete? Yes! Or a Russian mafia member? Wait, was I right? You were correct. <laughs> Kristen gets a history point! Yes! <laughs> there it is. Well, uh, you know, on that topic, I, I'd love to know, what are your favorite Olympic sports? Oh, mm. what aren't my favorite Olympic sports? Oh boy. Swimming? Gymnastics. Sure. I love track and field. Yeah. Uh, women's volleyball. Absolutely. Uh, some of the winter ones are fun, like ice skating and like the one where you're like skiing, but you have a sniper rifle. Yeah, it's biathlon. It's part skiing, part shooting. All awesome. Well, for my jelly beans, there's nothing quite like the Olympic Games. Nations from every corner of the globe coming together every two years to put aside their differences and unite in a shared activity. Scolding Russia for pumping their athletes full of illegal drugs and the sports. <laughs> Uh, wow! Yeah, I'm taking Russia to task. I don't care. They're gonna come for you. Yeah, whatever. Come at me, Putin! So wait, what does the jacket have to do with this? Is this a tracksuit? This is a, more than just a tracksuit. Hang on a sec. Oh, is this a gymnastics suit? It's a gymnastics outfit. It's a little onesie. That's good. Yeah, That's now it's less weird that you don't have pants on. <laughs> Well, the Olympics haven't always been a guaranteed rip-roaring great time. In fact, at the beginning of the 20th century, the world saw an Olympic Games that was such a catastrophe, it jeopardized the future of the event entirely. Today, we're talking about the disastrous 1904 St. Louis Summer Olympic Games. Oh, I know about this. Is this the one where uh, uh, the guy- Whoa, 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 whoa. No spoilies, Kristen. <laughs> but already impressed that you have a bit of a grasp on this one. So Here comes a history what? point. A history point for Kristen! Yeah. Oh, yay! <laughs> Shocker. Wow. It's like clockwork. <laughs> I haven't even opened my marker yet. Exactly. Around the dawning of the 20th century, the International Olympic Committee was in a bit of a pickle. They'd recently revived the Olympic Games for the modern era with the intention to repeat the games every four years as a big international spectacle. But they were only having middling success. How middling? Well, in 1900, the games were held in Paris, and not only were they overshadowed by the World's Fair simultaneously occurring in the city, but they were pretty hilariously slapdash. Hurdles were built from broken telephone poles. Swimming events were held in the Seine River, whose strong French current propelled competitors to achieve superhuman times. What a mess. Well, if there's anything to fall in the shadow of, it's the World Fair, baby. Ugh. So cool. Have you ever been to one? No, but most oh. of what we have today is based, Disneyland is no, like, boy, for the most part, go. I don't know if Disneyland would exist if it wasn't for the World's Fair. We don't need to get this one talking about Disneyland. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> I can't go on any of the rides. Oh, cause you're too short. I'm too small. <laughs> So, after a Parisian flop, how do you rustle up renewed public interest in the Olympic Games? With a little American razzle-dazzle, that's how! Whoa, trivia! And this should be an easy one because I already said a thing about it. What city did the IOC award the 1904 Olympics to? A. Chicago B. St. Louis or C. Detroit Is this a trick question? I'm not here to trick you, I'm here to uh, go on a magical adventure with you all. Beef Boy, you got an answer for us? Yeah, B St. Louis. There you go. Kristen. I'm also going to say B St. Louis. Oh, that's a great B. <laughs> what in the? That looks like an ass crack. <laughs> now it does. <laughs> no, well. Kind of yeah. no matter which way you, you do it there, ass. Points to neither of you, because it was a nasty little trick question. I'm a nasty little boy. Wow. <laughs> wow. They actually picked Chicago. Huh? Yes. What? Well, let me explain. Organizers of the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair were nervous that a competing international event in the American Midwest, i.e. a Chicago Olympics, would hurt fair attendance. So obviously the powers that be in St. Louis started a scheming about how to swipe the games from the Windy City. What did St. Louis do? 
A. They halted all railroad traffic passing through St. Louis bound for Chicago. B. They threatened to hold a competing sporting event. Or C. They sought help from a fickle genie who keeps making things worse no matter what you say! <laughs> I don't think it's C, but I appreciate, you know, the whimsy. It's not whimsical. It's devastating. How you guys doing? You locked in? I'm ready, I'm ready. Beef Boy, what do you got? I got A for Choo Choo Train. And Kristen? I also have A for Choo Choo Train, because the trains that went through St. Louis were like critical to the economic infrastructure to the rest of the country. Jelly beans for neither of you! Oh no! St. Louis secured six million smackers in funding and went about persuading the Amateur Athletics Union to have their national track and field championships in St. Louis that summer. The prestige we now associate with the Olympics just wasn't there in 1904, so a hip, edgy track and field championship sponsored by the AAU would draw America's top athletes away from the Olympics. Is AAU, is that the same thing that uh, that is the basketball organization today? I don't fucking know. <laughs> I guess I figured you would do some research. <laughs> oh, look at him shake. Here comes the negative jelly bean. Give it he to me. He gets a rotten jelly you mean. Yeah. A rotten yeah. jelly bean for the beef boy. Why don't you give me one more, you coward? Two you rotten jelly beans. Coward. Keep pushing me. Keep yeah. pushing me. Chicago had its back against the wall and asked Baron Pierre de Coubertin, president of the IOC, founder of the Modern Olympics, and proud papa of one wonderful mustache, mm -hmm. holy cow, what they should do. Worried about the future of his games, de Coubertin buckled to St. Louis's threat, and the Gateway City began preparing to host both a World's Fair and the Olympics. A surefire success, given how well it had gone over in Paris four years prior. That sounds busy. Yeah, that's a lot. Too busy. Like, LA is supposed to get some Olympics soon, and everyone I've talked to is like, uh, how about no? How about no, Scott? <laughs> Yeah, Austin, wow. Powers. Austin Powers, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> First to start was the World's Fair, opening in April of 1904, a few months before the Olympics were set to begin in July. With nearly 20 million people attending before it closed that December, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition sounds like it had all the things you'd expect from a World's Fair. The world's largest organ, the wood cabin Abe Lincoln grew up in, a whale skeleton, and plenty of new foods such as cotton candy and waffle cones. Imagine like a, like a Six Flags, but you know, with more whale bones and racism. Now, if that doesn't sound like your cup of tea, good news. The Olympics were about to roll into St. Louis, but also bad news. These particular Olympics were absolute dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, to give you some scope up top, in 2016, Brazil hosted the Olympic Games in Rio, which saw more than 11,000 athletes from 207 countries compete. So, how many countries competed in the 1904 Olympics? And this is a free write. Okay, so I guess I can't say A again. Just think of a number, and uh, that's your answer. Uh, Ryan, what you got? Uh, I put 12. Oh! And Kristen? I said 11! Oh, oh shit! Shit! <laughs> I'm wow. price is right in you! Oh, god damn it. You know what, Ryan? Uh, You're getting two jelly beans for nailing it! What?! Say what you will about the show me state, but in 1904 at least, seeing Missouri wasn't much incentive to figure out the logistics of getting your athletes across the ocean and then either up the Mississippi or across the nation by railroad. Of the approximately 650 athletes, fewer than 100 were from outside of the U.S. And of those, half were Canadian. Not even Baron Pierre de Coubertin could be bothered to make the trek. Cool. Nice, dude. Presumably due to the low athlete count, participants could join some competitions at any time, even from off the street. I'd hop in to do whatever they wanted me to do. Basketball. Uh, javelin toss. Pole vaulting would be really funny because there's a possibility the pole would snap and I'd break my neck. That's a plus. I mean, could you That's think of a, a more baller way to go out? Yeah, living to your old. Yeah. Eh, overrated. Now, apart from low athlete attendance, these Olympics also saw some unusual sports. Americans swept the podium for tug of war. A diving competition called Plunge for Distance was basically just the game you play as kids where you jump into a pool and see how far down you can go without using your arms. It was also the last time golf, the most unusual sport, would be in the Olympics until the 2016 Rio Games. These were also the only games to feature something called Roke. <laughs> Explain to me the rules of Roke. Oh no, this is a free, is this? You don't even have to write it. You can just try to explain it to me. Okay, well, I will not go first. Ryan, <laughs> explain to me the rules of Roke. It's been a while since I've seen Roke, so I gotta Put think about it. Put yourself in the mind of a Roke player. You know, Roke is this game True. where you uh, take a kind of 
substantial bouncy ball, uh -huh. almost like a medicine ball with a little bit more bounce, okay. and you get one bounce, and it has uh -huh. to hit another contestant right in the nuts. Oh! <laughs> or you roke them in the nuts, as they would say on the street. Roke so, them. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, how you yeah. play rope. Kristen? I'm gonna guess that it's like kind of a biathlon type game where like you have to race somebody, and at the end of the race, you have to fight a person. Oh. So it's like sort of a racing fighting combination. Unfortunately, neither of you have nailed it. It's sort of a weird mixture of croquet and billiards, like croquet with a shorter mallet and walls that you can bank shots off of. It sounds like something you'd spend a lot of money on to be very bored. Oh, for sure. You guys ever play croquet? Yes. No. You've never played croquet? I'm an Asian Hispanic man. I've never played croquet. I was gonna say, you, you've never had a summer where your parents were like really sick of you and they were like, why don't we just throw $45 at the problem? <laughs> now, unfortunately for the folks at the IOC, as was the case in Paris, the Olympics were seen as more of a World's Fair sideshow than their own event. Newspaper coverage was spotty at best, and the fair itself had its own sporting competitions. So while the Olympics as a whole were a complete embarrassment, the running of the 1904 Olympic marathon deserves special attention. Yes, it Kristen, does. is this heading in the direction that you'd prefer it to? Yes, it is. As long as this ends with a brown medal, I'm good. A brown oh. medal? It's when a marathon runner poops their pants while they're running. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Why don't we start with the marathon course, which might best be described as sadistic. <laughs> there were a total of seven hills, each between 100 to 300 feet high. Some of the roads were strewn with cracked stones, while others were covered in inches of dust. The course wasn't closed, meaning runners had to dodge traffic and even trains. Some cars with trainers and coaches drove alongside the runners, kicking dust up into clouds that runners would then breathe in. The race also happened to start at 3.03 p.m. on an August day in the humid and 90 degree St. Louis summer air. Oof. On top of all these conditions, organizers tossed in one extra wrinkle. What was the dumbest thing about the 1904 Olympic marathon? A. It was 15 miles longer than any previous marathon. B. Runners were allowed and even encouraged to trip one another. Or C, runners weren't allowed to drink water. Oh, I don't know this one. Oh, man. That's okay. Sometimes you just gotta guess. I'm just gonna have to. Ryan, what you got? I'm gonna go with C, no agua. Kristen. I'm gonna go with B, tripping. B, tripping. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got a little skit for you now. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, and then he died. Good day to you, James Sullivan, my boss and organizer of the 1904 Olympic Games. Ah, little assistant boy, you've caught me in a good mood. The plans are all set, and I have no doubt these will be the finest Olympic Games the world will ever see. Hmm, baby, though I do have one last question about your plans for the marathon. Ooh, is it the seven brutal hills? Do you think we need more? Uh, no. Is it the cracked stones that runners will have to dance amongst like merry minstrels? Are the stones not large enough? No, sir, the stones are fine. Well, then what can it be? Out with the boy! Don't you think the runners need, like, water? Bah! To you, bah! We are testing the limits of the human body, the effects of purposeful dehydration. If those greedy runners want water, they can get some from the water tower at mile six. Or at mile... Fuck. <coughs> uh, sir, I need some water myself. I got... <coughs> Jesus Christ, get it together. <laughs> I'm bound back now. Hoist it on your own petard. Yes, yes. Oh, the roadside well located somewhere around mile 12. That's it. <coughs> what if somebody dies? Well, then they'll have died for sport and for science. Uh, I think my answer would have been better. I have to disagree. I think the answer uh, th that was best was the one that actually happened. You're just saying that because you got points for it. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Oh, is it? Oh, you're back? Is he back? Where are you? I, lo I miss your little outfit. Where is Hi. It? Oh, hey. <laughs> Hi. Point to Ryan on that one. Wow. Well, there you go. James Sullivan's experiment had 32 test subjects, the 32 competitors in the marathon, which included 10 Greek men who had never run a marathon before. Let's meet some of our intrepid athletes. There was John Lorden, who had won the previous year's Boston Marathon, and so could have been considered a favorite for the Olympic Marathon. Anyone placing a bet on Lorden, however, was quickly disappointed as he started blowing chunks and dropped out within the first half mile. That's uh, bad. Yeah. Sorry, I was just thinking, the thing I like about your little outfit the best is that it's actually a, a ladies gymnast uniform. I wear what feels good, and I that's, like to express good. myself via my clothing. I'm here for it, and I, I'm, I'm happy to be- What is he doing it. right now? I'm just <laughs> feeling myself over here, you know? <laughs> He's dancing, love him, or die. It, 
Joining Lorden in the Did Not Finish Club was William Garcia of California, who at one point collapsed on the side of the road. Garcia was taken to the hospital and almost died with an esophagus coated in dust and hemorrhaging from a ripped stomach lining. Holy shit! How do you yeah. rip your stomach lining? Perhaps the only feather in this marathon's cap was that it featured the first ever Olympians from the continent of Africa. Lean Tauyane and John Masiane of the Tswana tribe of South Africa were performers at the World's Fair, participating in a recreation of the Boer War. The men were well prepared both for the recreation and the marathon as they had served in the actual Boer War as dispatch runners. Aouyane finished ninth. But what happened to Masiane? A, he was chased off course by a dog. B, he was struck by a milk truck. Or C, he tripped while crossing over a bridge and had to swim to the other side. All right. Sure, I'm just taking a shot in the dark here. All right, Ryan, what do we got? I'm gonna go with A, chased off the, the course by a dog. Uh, Kristen? I'm gonna also say A, chased by a dog, because I know somebody was chased off the course by a dog. Points to you both! A dog chased him for a whole mile! Holy shit! Masiane still finished the race, but we'll check back in with him later to see how he did. He was able to outrun a dog for a full mile? Yeah, that's crazy! That's fucking also, insane! What dog was it? Was it a stray dog? Yeah, I mean, it's the early 1900s, I bet there's street dogs everywhere. Another racer, five foot tall Cuban mailman, Felix Carvajal, had earned money to pay his own way to the Olympics by showing off his running abilities around Cuba, even trotting the entire length of the island. When he arrived in New Orleans, however, he lost all of his money gambling, which meant he had to walk and hitchhike the more than 600 miles to St. Louis. Carvajal arrived at the race shortly before it began, wearing a white long-sleeved shirt, long dark pants, street shoes, and a beret. Whoa! <laughs> Those being his only clothes, that was what he raced in. Yes! Ain't yes, that like yes, the Big Easy? Yes. Carvajal was also famished. At one point, he stopped a car and asked for some peaches that the occupants mm. were enjoying. When the riders refused, the rascally racer stole some anyways. <laughs> what happened to Felix next? A, he was arrested mid-race for thievery. B, he stole some more fruit. C, he fell in love. Wait. <laughs> what? <laughs> Something to think about. I don't think he fell in love. Although you don't is, know. I don't know anything. Are we locked in? Let's do I it. I guess so. Ryan, Let's what do you got? It. I got A for arrested. Okay. Kristen? I got A for okay. abolish the police. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> no history points for that one, unfortunately. You know what they say about St. Louis produce. Yummy! Along the side of the road were some apple orchards, and still hungry after his peaches, Felix decided to grab some. Unfortunately, the apples gave him a grumbly little tum-tum, and attempting to alleviate the painful cramps that resulted, Felix laid down and took a nap. <gasps> brown metal! What? Oh, I thought this was the brown metal. Oh, no, no, no. As we learned from the tortoise and the hare, while taking a nap doesn't help one's chances of winning a race, it is not a disqualifying action. We'll check back in with Felix later. Among the American racers was Boston brass worker Thomas Hicks. Thomas was one racer who had a training team riding alongside him during the race. In fact, it was his training team from whom Felix Carvajal stole his peaches. While not pleased about losing their peaches, the training team had something else besides stone fruit for their man Hicks. What performance-enhancing drink did Hicks trainers give him? A. Ocean water. B. New England clam chowder. Or C. Egg whites and rat poison. <laughs> uh, Ryan, what do you got? B, chowder. You're a chowder head, huh? I'm willing to lose for that one because I love mm. me some fucking oh, clam I love chowder. chowder. Why do you like liquid fish? Mm. Oh, it's so good. Cut. You put the little Ooh. oyster crackers in it. Ooh, I love a chowder. I love a chowder. <laughs> Kristen, what'd you put? Can I go? Is it yeah, 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 what <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, okay, we, were, I, we, were, we were in a chowder trance there. I put C. I put C. <laughs> Those keep ending up upside down. Point to Kristen. Yay! Hicks trainers gave him a combination of egg whites and strychnine while he was running a marathon in 90 degree heat. Is this back when doctors were just like, listen, we've invented tons of drugs and we don't know what to do with any of them. It feels like a weird thing to just pull out and test in the moment. This feels like something you should have tested before the race, maybe. It very much feels like a situation <laughs> of them just looking in their bag to see what they have. We got a secret weapon. The only secret about it is we don't know what it does. <laughs> Miraculously, it did not kill him, but we will check in with him later. While all the racers were slogging through this absolute hell, 
a little more than a third of the way through the marathon, New York bricklayer Fred Lohrs adopted a strategy that gave him a leg up on his competition. Ooh. What did Lohrs do? A. He started riding in a car. B. He took a shortcut that shaved almost four miles off the course. Or C. He started drinking water. Duh. Are we locked in? Yeah. Ryan, what do you got? I put A, he hitched it. He hitchhiked the way. Love it. And Kristen? I got uh, B for he shortcut. Around mile nine, Lors started to cramp up. <laughs> Try to relieve these cramps, Lors hopped into a car and rode for 11 <laughs> miles. <laughs> Point to Ryan. Lors wasn't particularly shy about his tactic either, waving at spectators and fellow runners from the automobile. Oh, that's amazing. Fellow Runners? He was just waving at people as he blew past them in a car. I love that. Eventually, Lors hopped out of the car and ran the final five miles, crossing the finish line first. To understandably tremendous applause. After all, an American had won! Hooray! Most of the crowd had no way of knowing that he had done so by running only about 14 miles of the race. Alice Roosevelt, daughter of President Theodore Roosevelt, placed a wreath upon Lors' cheating head and was about to drape the gold medal around his cheating neck, when finally, someone who knew of Lors' treachery shouted, Imposter! In response, it sounds like Lors kind of just shrugged and said he was only goofing, that he was never going to actually accept the gold medal, sure. Understandably, the crowd's cheers turned into hearty and deserved boos. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's like objecting to a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, with Lors disqualified, who won the 1904 Olympic marathon? A, was it John, the Boer War veteran who was chased by dogs? B, Felix, the fruit napping napper? Or C, Hicks, the rat poisoned brass worker. What do you got, Ryan? Uh, B, Felix. Kristen. Uh, I'm gonna say A, the guy who was chased by dogs. Interesting. Well, I guess we're about to find out. Whoa! Well, here he comes, limping into the stadium like some sort of mechanical piece of machinery, scarcely able to lift his legs and with barely any signs of life in his eyes. It's Thomas Hicks! aided by yet another dose of egg whites and strychnine being carried by that shady training team of his, his feet slowly shuffling back and forth. He's done it, he's won, and he's collapsed. He's lost eight pounds during the race and has rat poison coursing through his veins, but we'll see if we can get an interview with him. Thomas, Thomas, what say you? Uh, uh, the terrific hills simply tear a man to pieces. Oh, oh. <laughs> Points to nobody, by the way. And that is an actual quote from him. Is... I love it. It's poetic. As for the others, John got back on course and finished 12th, while Felix, the napping fruit napper, went on to finish fourth, believe it or not. Wow. Uh, in total, only 14 of the 32 runners would even cross the finish line. James Sullivan's barbaric marathon was a total failure and a perfect symbol of the St. Louis Olympics as a whole. What was gained by this? Not much. It just kind of seems like a bunch of guys just made a lot of bad memories. Look, hills are very tough. I ran up a hill going up La Cienega the other day and I thought I was gonna die. Yeah. And I didn't even have rat poison in me. Instead of sitting with the taste of the St. Louis games in their mouths for four years, an extra Olympics was held in Athens in 1906 in an attempt to repair the damage done to the Olympics reputation. 20 nations participated and the intermediary games helped salvage the idea of an international athletics competition paving the way for the much improved 1908 London Olympics. But boy, oh boy, will we never forget that sexy St. Louis summer full of peaches, poison, and internal hemorrhaging. Well, that concludes our history lesson. I'm gonna go tally the scores to see who receives the coveted cup and the title of history master. While I do that, please enjoy this special performance from the Olympic Torch. Wow, a celebrity. Whoop. Oh! <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's good. Yes. I like that. I have awoken from my four year slumber. Look at his little face. The time has finally come to play the games of old. There's medals to be won. Can you attain the goal? Each country <laughs> sends the best to put the medal to the test. How far would you go to prove your? Would you steal some fruits to eat? And love I do that choking eat? Would you climb those dusty hills? Check it eggs and poison pills? Let a dog tear you apart? Would you get hit by a car? 
Pepsi commercial. You must sacrifice all for a little bit glory. Oh, he's not dead. I must douse my hellish flame with your subservient sweat and return to the dream of slumber that offers me the only respite from the wretched waking life of an anthropomorphic torch. A pox upon the being that cursed me with sentience. <laughs> and would you break all of your bones for a parade when you get home? Would you scoop out both your eyes to what? win that fucking prize? There's no such thing as second place. You'd be a national disgrace. Break your body, sell your soul. You better get that fucking goal. This is a horrifying song. This is great. Gotta get the goal. Get the goal. Every one of his songs this season has had his characters have an existential crisis in the middle of the song. I feel like that's every single song ever, and that's what makes them good. Oh, wow, what a harrowing performance from that torch. He seems like he should talk to somebody. Yeah, I, yeah, I was seems a worried like it. about him, but it was a bop. Now, you guys are going to believe this. I am shocked, shocked to report that Kristen Sirico is our history master, and so she has rightfully earned the Covenant Cup. Yeah, Brian, makes thanks sense. for trying. <laughs> Kristen, <laughs> sense. go claim your reward. Wait, what? Are you <laughs> proud of yourself? <laughs> I am, every week. Wait, oh. What's this really about? Huh? You know exactly what I'm talking about, you I little don't. blue piece of... Little piece of what, huh? <laughs> Why'd you say it? I don't think I need to say it. Sounds like you're afraid. Yeah, that's what it is, I'm afraid. Hey, Kristen! Oh, she's back. back! Hey, Kristen, back. how's it going? I'm back! <laughs> Congrats! You just have being fun and being pals yeah, over here. good. <laughs> Look at this little... He's got the jelly bean! Oh, got it all. It well, like you have very much deservedly it. won that. I get a that. professor pin? Wow. Absolutely! Oh, that's, that's much good. better than money. <laughs> Thank you for watching Puppet History. We'll see you next week. He's a dead man. Who's a second